finally, I think we all would agree cost is a barrier to adoption. In our survey, a pretty obvious conclusion, but guided surgery would be used much more if it was less expensive. When you look at the cost breakdown of currently available systems, first you have the upfront investment in implant planning software. You have a software annual maintenance charge. You need a guided surgery kit, which is usually proprietary. And then the, the cost of the guides can range from 300 to 650 and up. Additionally, there are fees for a radiographic stent, oftentimes. If the file has to be merged or cleaned, another charge, and obviously a, a charge for treatment planning. With the thin layer system, it's based on Blue Sky Plan software, which is powerful software, and that's free. There's no annual maintenance, and it works with almost all systems and most drills. You don't need special drills. And the single implant guides are $249, $50 for an additional, additional site and uh, a charge for planning your case. I think at this point, Michael, if there are any questions, then I think if, if there are any questions at this point, it might be a good break to answer questions. If not, I'll continue on. Well, if anybody has any questions, they can be entered into the chat box on the bottom right, and Dr. Haber can address them. Okay, I think we can continue onwards at this point. Good. All right. So and I I'll interrupt you if there are any questions. Okay. At this point, I think um, I'll just review the characteristics of the thin layer guide system, that it's based on the en enhanced Blue Sky Plan planning tools. We need a, a model and uh, a plan of the case. It's usable in molar sites and in patients with minimal opening. It requires the same vertical clearance as freehand drilling. You have physical and visual access to the surgical site. Works with most implant systems and drills. Custom disposable drill stops are provided, and radiographic stents are usually not needed. I'd like to now go through a series of cases to illustrate how this system is used clinically. We selected cases to basically show how the guide system is used in different parts of the mouth under different circumstances. So why don't we start our first case? This is a lower second molar with flap extension. The first thing we have to do is plan the case. So when you open up Blue Sky Plan, you'll see this screen with your cross-sectional screen, your axial screen, panoramic screen, and the 3D screen. The first thing we recommend in this case is to go to the 3D screen and select the articulated model. What this does for you is it provides the outline of the opposing tooth in your cross-sectional view, as you can see right here. We next would go to the panoramic screen, and here we would size the implant. This is you know, maybe a, a 5 by 11 5 implant. And then we use the abutment as a virtual tooth. In this case, the abutment was sized at about 10 millimeter diameter. So you can move this into position, and you can see your mesial distal orientation. You can move your abutment against the distal of the tooth, and right off the bat, your implant is in a pretty nice position. We next go to the cross-sectional screen, and here you can see the implant is placed. I can see the outline of the crest, so it gives me some indication right now of how thick the gingiva is over the implant, and that has implications for the vertical placement of the implant. Secondly, the center line of the implant, in this case, was arranged to meet the lingual cusp of the opposing molar, as it should be. And so now the mesial distal orientation of this implant is set quite easily. We then go back to the 3D screen, and we select centered model. The centered model is a 3D image of a model in which there is a reference point, and that reference point is in the ideal location for this implant. 
For a second molar implant, the entry point would be six to seven millimeters from the distal of the, opposing, of the adjacent tooth. And then we can see where the center line of her implant is relative to this ideal position. You may not always be able to get it in the ideal position, but at least you know where you are relative to the ideal position. And this is one way in which you can overcome the looking at 3D in 2D problem, because this is based on the, the ideal position is based upon a model, which you can see in hand, not on a 3D in 2D. You can also then look at this and use the abutment as a virtual tooth and see quite accurately exactly the relationship between the future tooth and the adjacent tooth. Finally, you can look at the occlusal relationship and you can see exactly where the center line of the implant will meet the upper molar. And as a final quality control test, you can look at all the views and just check it out to make sure everything is okay, and then this plan can be submitted for fabrication of a drill guide. So now let's look at the first case clinically. It's a lower second molar. What we've done here is we placed the uh, spear drill in a plastic insert in the tube guide and took a film just to illustrate the trajectory of this implant. And here you can see, in this case, we used a tube guide to start. The plastic insert is placed with a spear drill to create a bleeding point. We created a pilot hole. In this case, it was a flap exposure. And one thing I wanted to highlight is that the guide in no way impedes your ability to reflect the site, reflect the flap, or to access the site, or to see the site. The, this is a lower second molar. Here you can see the drill is inserted at an angle. It's brought upright, engaging the guide hole, and brought to depth. And you can see how the depth stop engages the top of the guide to control depth. When we look at this view, you can see an implant, a, a surgical analog in place illustrating the position within the guide hole. And we do this sequentially with each drill until you reach the desired diameter of your osteotomy. And again, here you can see final drill in place in the center of the guide hole. With a system also, you can use the system with your countersink, your tap, and your implant driver. And as you can see in the top left panel, that's a countersink centered in the guide hole, used to countersink the osteotomy. In the top right, the drill stop fit the tap, and so the tap is being used centered in the guide hole. And finally, in the bottom panel, the implant driver is centered in the guide hole to place the implant. And as we'll see in a later case, um, that can be a very, very critical piece because in type three or type four bone, when you're using self-tapping implants, they can find their own, own way regardless of how the osteotomy was positioned. Finally, you take a look at the finished case. You can see the implant position. And when you go to the bottom panel, you can see that the position of the implant clinically is exactly as it was in the plant. Another point I'd like to make is that this system can be used without a drill stop. And I've done this, as you'll see in subsequent cases, many times. So if, if you prefer to do this, it feels like freehand drilling, but it's guided because the position of your entry point on the gingival surface is defined and because the center of the guide hole defines the second point of your trajectory. So it feels like freehand drilling, but in fact, it is guided. In this case is a flapless case where we placed implants in the upper right posterior segment. The patient was missing teeth number three, four, and five. 
And on the bottom panel, you can see the thin layer guide. And on the right-hand side, this is done a little differently. This is a pilot hole guide that sits right on the surface of the gingiva with holes to guide the pilot hole drill. So here's the pilot hole guide placed on the patient. We go through each hole with the two millimeter drill, and you can see we have our pilot holes, just very shallow little indentations. Next, we go through with our series of drills where the drill is centered in the guide hole, the tip is in the pilot hole, and we drill to depth. We're using the depth markings on the side of the drill. Here you can see the position of the three implants with guide pins in place. This was a flapless case, so we used a tissue punch, and we used the guide hole here to allow us some control when we place the implant. This is the finished case, and you can see the position of the implants radiographically and clinically, and the final restoration. And the restoration was very straightforward because the implants were positioned in a rather prosthetically ideal way. Well, let me interrupt you with a few questions, if that's okay. Sure. The first question that came in is regarding the scanning protocol for the model. Yeah. If you could elaborate on that a bit. Yeah. What we do is um, we cone beam scan plaster models, and that gives us tremendous flexibility in what we do. And that's, that's how we get the models. So when, when people send us models, they're cone beam scanned and then merged in with the, uh, with the uh, blue sky plan uh, anatomy of the patient with the bone scan. So is that something that you scan, or is that something that uh, the doctor should have scanned with the patients? Well, if we find that docs who have scanners in their office do it themselves, or if someone sends us a model, we'll scan it for them. Okay, the next question that came in is asking if the drill guide also acts as a stop for the depth. Yes, that's exactly what it's designed to do. The, 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 um, yes. Okay. Another question that came in is if you collaborate on how the surgical guide allows flexibility to modify the surgical plan at the time of surgery. Yes. In this system, let's say your entry point, let me go back to here. Let's say your entry point, when you open this case, well, this is a closed case, but let's say the entry point is, is off and you want to move it a millimeter, a half a millimeter, one way or the other. What you do is you look at your scan and you see if you, if you do that, how does that affect the trajectory? And you can make an alteration either only in the entry point or sometimes you can make an alteration in the guide hole. You can put crosshairs on the guide hole. You see these crosshairs here? Let's say you make a mark half a millimeter to this side here, and you move this a half a millimeter this way, you'll have the same trajectory, but you'll, have, you'll slide the uh, implant a little half a millimeter in that direction. So yes, you can have flexibility in, uh, you can change the plan at the time of surgery. Okay, I think that uh, wraps up the questions for now. If there are more questions, you can enter them into the chat box on the bottom right. And we'll address them as the webinar proceeds. I mean, in regard to the last question, you're not restricted by a tube. So if you don't like what you see, you can change it. But when you change it, you have to be aware of your cross-sectional view so that the change is compatible with the anatomy of the bone. But I've changed many a trajectory when I didn't like what I saw, and they work out fine. Okay, next case, tooth number 31, I call this nightmare access. The lower second molar in a patient who did not open very wide, he had significant bone loss on the distal of tooth number 30. So this was a deep site, and his molars were set back in his jaw. So this was a very, very difficult placement. 